Hi there, Christian Henson from Spitfire Audio here. Hope you're well. A few years ago, I made a film about how I confronted my imposter syndrome, overcame it, and applied my skills as a drum programmer, which is what kind of got me into Hollywood, to orchestral programming and how I became an orchestral programmer without going to a conservatoire, reading music, etc., etc., and really focused in on the thing that stops us doing stuff is a fear that we're not going to be able to do it. Now, I wanted to turn that concept on its head and talk to you about cinematic drum programming. I know by speaking to many of you that drum programming is maybe not your wheelhouse. So like the film I made a couple of years ago, I'm going to give you just some basic pointers, five basic pointers, to get you up and running and using a part of the orchestral canon that is so important to our craft of media composition. It's also just so much fun. So I'm going to be using Hammers by Charlie Clauser exclusively today. I think because it is the most all-round drum percussion tool that I've ever used. It's great for beginners because it's got some loops that are very kind of educational, give you a real kind of guidance of how, if you want to program the individual hits, how to best go about doing that. But also, it's a very kind of pro-end tool for, I guess, kind of grunty old sea dogs like myself. But the principles I'll be discussing today could be applied to any drum library, whether that be the Darwin percussion in Albion, the original cinematic percussion range or indeed Hans Zimmer percussion and the many other developers who make percussion libraries damage et al. These aren't rules, these are just pointers. Pointer number one, it's not just about leathering it or as Hans Zimmer says, just cranking it out. Sounds good, but it'll become very tiresome and unimpactful very soon. So the first thing to consider is not just what you're playing, it's how to voice it. Whether you're looking at a trap kit, you know, bass, kick drum, snare, hi-hat, or indeed a military band, you'll notice that the deepest percussion plays the least, the middle range percussion plays a little bit more, and the top, i.e. the hi-hats or your glockenspiels, will play the most. This is a good starting point for cinematic percussion. And if you look at the Cerdo loops, say, in Hammers, you'll hear the parts they're playing have a lot of space in between them. So this is a great pointer for programming these individual hits. So let's start with the bass drums. Now, I like to quantize to a slight swing, so I'm going to do a 16B swing. I'll keep those quantized absolute because they're the kind of backbone. But as we move up, I'll lessen the strength of the quantization, and I'll explain why I do that in a moment. So let's move to the surdos. So what I'm going to do is play just a little bit more, and for me, it's going to be all about the way you accent the drums. If you watch a drummer playing his snare on a drum kit, you'll, you'll see that he, he's probably hitting that drum up to 16 times a bar, but the notes that you really hear are just on the two and the four. This is where I want to take the strength down a little bit so it just doesn't sound like a machine. Let's quantize that and again bring the strength down. And basically the strength just puts in time the bits that are badly out of time. And as we're moving up in pitch, I'm just going to increase the frequency of notes. But again with these accents.
So what I'm going to do is just add a little bit of interest here, just it's even faster kind of notes by using some roughs. and some flams at the end. Now I want to just do some more in-between bits with the surdos, but instead of using the four player, which has this kind of epic sound, I'm just going to go to solo. Losing a bit of headroom here, it's starting to kind of clip and limit, so I'm just going to pull this down. Now I'm just going to save that and just show you what happens when we tighten everything up. So we go from these four-player sounds to the solo sounds, say for example from the four-player here to a solo, and then just make everything totally 100% tight. So no swing at all, just straight quantized here. So it has a slightly less epic sound, and that really takes to maybe adding a bit of distortion and really screwing up the signal. Etc. Etc. The second pointer with cinematic percussion is to create light and shade. The loud stuff will sound loud if it's next to quiet stuff. So it's always great to create moments of, of uh, it heightened tension that isn't necessarily dramatic and epic. So I'm going to go on to some of the scrap here. Again, put that to a 16B. Let's take the strength down just a bit. For many of you, you might not be actually playing this in, you might be drawing this in. And this is when it's really important to make sure that we've got a variety of um, different velocities. That's what makes drums sound real. If they're all in the red running at, you know, 127, um, it's going to sound like a computer. You see, the minute I start altering the volume so they're less constant, you have a much more kind of groovy, interesting rhythm. So by doing a little bit of post-production like that, you just keep the interest. It stops sounding like a loop, stops sounding like a computer. I'm also going to add in some scrap loops that have been warped in this library. Amazing warps. So let's go scrap. And again, you'll see that it just adds a bit of interest. So let's adopt some of these principles of post-production to the frame drum part in the previous section. So applying the light and shade, what we're going to do is come back with this pattern. But instead of being on frame drums, I'm going to switch to the darbukas just to give a different kind of colour there. And from toms to roto toms. Everything in hammers has been organised into bricks of six notes. So we've got hit, 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 rough, flam and roll. So what I'm going to do is bring everyone back with a nice roll there. The third principle, think about gear changes. So it's not just about getting louder and louder or bigger and bigger. It's imagining that your drum kit is like a motor car and you're going to go up a gear. So you can do this in, in two ways, with simply with tempo. And I'll just run it with the metronome so you can hear it. So again, using Charlie's loops is a bit of a, a drum tutor, if you will. It's going to be interesting to have a listen to what happens when we use the bass loop 
and it swaps tempo. So this is quite a busy loop for a bass drum. Chases tempo. It changes pattern to something that's less constant, that is more varied. This is because the loops have been specially curated. So when you're speeding up, it's not just speeding up or playing the same thing faster. So when we're doing these gear changes, it's, it's always worth thinking about what you're getting your drums to play, particularly with these fast 16s. It just kind of sounds a little bit Mickey Mouse. So what I'm gonna do is actually switch to a triplet feel. And again, let's just pull apart these velocities that are similar. So that's an interesting way of just kind of creating a little bit of a drum phase there. And what I'm going to do is just put that at the top there. Now I'm sure you'll be used to the trick of doing a straight beat. and then filling it with a triplet fill. But you can do that the other way around. So with a triplet rhythm pattern, you can fill with a straight fill. Okay, let's just go back a little bit and see where we're kind of at. For me, that's not feeling like enough of a gear change. So I'm going to actually take this up to 180 BPM. The next pointer is sucks and drops. We've already got a kind of couple of these. And then this roll in here. Where sucks are really useful is for those awkward cuts. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna make this even more awkward. I'm gonna make this kind of uh, come in here, say. Duplicate the bass drums. So what I'm gonna do is enable reverse and make this as long as possible. Great stuff. I'm going to do the same with the Surdos. In order to create moments of real drama, for me it's like the kind of the ocean. When a really big wave comes, you've got to let the water really kind of drag out before it crashes down. So you're going to be going full pelt, leathering it possibly. And to really increase the drama, what we've got to do is we've got to create some space. And you do that with drops and sucks. So let's have a listen to this. So I'm going to repeat that bar, but with absolutely everyone, no shame. Toms, Darbukas. And then let's get another suck in that wave going out, crashing back in. So for me, I would tend to go in here and put real intention be behind all of these separations of dynamics, the use of roughs, flams. I don't have the blessing of time. Uh, I think this is one of the problems with these tutorials is, is that 
for a sequence like this, how long is this? A one minute sequence. You know, I would spend at least two days working on a rhythm sequence like this. And that's what's also great about hammers, is it can speed up the process for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap out some of my program parts for loops. Right, final pointer and uh, an Achilles heel for some of you, and that is mixing. With libraries like Darwin, Cinematic Percussion, Hans Zimmer Percussion and Hammers, I really would advise against messing around with the quality of the sound too much, particularly the bottom end. So we have some problems here at the moment, and that is that I'm pushing it too far. You'll see that I've got everything going into a drums bus, and it's all sounding very hot. Now you have to be, I guess you can make the bus as hot as you like, but the thing that you need to be very wary of is distorting the master bus, because if you're stemming stuff out, you're you're not going to be able to recreate that kind of squash sound. Something I find happens a lot with professional engineers is there's a temptation to compress drums like these. I think this sounds just strangled. So what I'm going to do is re-attenuate the whole mix. We've not used any automation. So what I'm going to then do is just go through each sound, see if there's anything I want more of, if there's anything I want less of tweak that and then what I'm going to do with the drum bus is just make it a little bit more efficient so we can get back up to that dynamic level. So let's just check the bus. I personally wouldn't dare to add any more bass to the bassier drums that Charlie has recorded and mixed. He has been monitoring through seriously expensive monitors and has huge amounts of experience of this. So for me, I know he's gone maximum fat and it would be, in my humble opinion, foolhardy to try and get any more out of that bottom end. So I trust that. And that's the whole point of these libraries that are curated. So all I'm then going to do is just chop off the very bottom and then what, what that'll do is take away all of the rumble we can't actually hear with our ears and make the mix that much more efficient. So. Compared to, and you can see there's a lot going on there. It's already got quite a bright clicky sound to it, so I'm not gonna do anything there. I'm just gonna do this and I will probably copy this across quite a lot of the channels. See that's a bit overwhelming that bottom end there. Okay and what I might do is just give that just a bit more of a boost here so you can really hear it. A bit, bit more top end, maybe. I might just compress this slightly to, to make the quieter stuff come up a bit. Reverse again, I'm going to do that one. And I'm going to copy this over to that too. Okay, with this, I'm actually going to get rid of a bit of this bottom end so we don't get too muddy. I imagine the rotor toms will probably do something similar with those. So taking away the fundamental, the actual kind of note that's in there, I'll do the same with... There's probably a little bit of something at the very bottom there. And the same with scrap. 
And what we might do is just EQ out a bit of the fan here. So I'm just going to put just a gentle bit of um, like mastering compression on that just just takes off the, the, the hot stuff. And then again, just sort out the, the, the EQ so that the, there's not too much waffly bottom end under where we can hear. And then finally, a little bit of limiting, but nothing too heavy. And I guess with that last note of, of, of mixing is a library like this, it really has been mixed for you. And if you're uncertain, just, well, just don't go there. So this is programming day one, and this should really take a day to do. I'm thinking of turning this into a contextual track with Albion Solstice, might be quite fun. So if you want to check that out, and indeed hammers, click on the links in the video description down below. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments. I do read them and do answer them when the questions are good. So thanks for watching to the end as always. Do subscribe if you haven't done already. And just remember, don't fear the things you haven't done. What's stopping you from doing them is fear itself, not your ability. See you next time.